I've been to some beautiful like places and like the amount of places I've got to see, the amount of the different cultures I've been exposed to. And you'd see the people living in huts, barefoot, always smiling on their face, mm. like always happy. And so I'm, you know, I'm always thinking to myself, like, man, I got to bet the America. I got to worry about these bills. I got to worry about this. Make sure my credit's good. Mm-hmm. I got to make sure, blah, blah, blah. You know, all this stuff is taken care of. I'm like, these people living on this island, the different cultures I've been exposed to. So I know that you'll agree, enjoying myself while at work is the vibe that I'm trying to be on. So I want to invite you guys to Sidebar ATL here in Atlanta, Georgia. Sidebar, on top of the good food and live music, they have three different experiences. That means you can join me in the garden room, in the gold room if you want to try the top of the line hookah and they also have the dungeon where I hear what happens in the dungeon stays in the dungeon so it's the perfect mix if you're here on business or you want to blow off some steam after work you can meet me at sidebar ATL so that you can have a little bit of dinner and then turn up afterwards if that's your jam so check us out 79 Poplar Street here in downtown Atlanta or you can call 678-800-0741 let's get it work and play at the same time right <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Work and Play Podcast. I'm your host, Arielle Young, and I have a really special guest today. It's not so many times that we get to like get into three transitions all in one story, so we're going to get a chance to talk about all of your different journeys. I'm not going to spoil it. I'm not going to okay, spoil it. Okay. So without further, further ado, would you please take it away for me? Hey everybody. How you doing? My name is Brandon Abrahams. Um, just a regular guy that's been through, like Ariel said, a couple transitions in life. Um, going from the military sector to the corporate sector to now entrepreneurship. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm an emerging entrepreneur, so I'm still learning a lot of things and I'm still new to a lot of things, but I'm in a good place right now and I got a good um, circle around me of people that are doing uh, well in entrepreneurship, to say the least. And um, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a journey. It's been a journey. Yeah, it's, it, it's always going to be a journey. The journey never ends. <laughs> I mean, but, and, and then again, like, you've actually experienced three different, like, career titles, right? Yeah. Emerging entrepreneur, but there was corporate professional. Mm-hmm. There, was, there was military soldier. Navy. Uh, well, I was actually a, a petty officer. Petty in the Navy. officer. Got yeah. you, got you. So we got to get mm-hmm. into all of those journeys. Mm-hmm. So if we start back at, like, well, actually, let's not even start back at the top. Talking about entrepreneurship, and we were literally just getting into, like, you exploring this new space right. what is it be, what has it been like for you to be in this new transition like starting all over again kind of like freshman it's great i i love it because it's just a, it's, it kind of gives me a whole new perspective on life and a whole new perspective on um the like what it takes to build something yourself mm. Right, so the whole entre- <clears throat> entrepreneurship is, it's cultivated by you. So everything that you do has a direct result to your success or your failure in entrepreneurship. Yeah. Whereas, you know, sometimes you can get into a, uh, even in the, in the corporate or in the military, you can get into a position where it's kind of like, you're just stagnant and no matter, <clears throat> no matter what you do, you can't go higher. Of course, you can always do something to get in trouble to get lower. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, at some at sometimes you get to a position where it's just like, what do I do now? I'm just sitting here waiting. And I always I always hated that part of the military yeah. and the corporate the corporate space. Yeah, because it was like I feel like I'm a person that's like constantly growing and constantly wanting to learn and constantly wanting to evolve. Well, if you're in that if you're in that kind of setting like you know corporate or military there's parameters that you can't go you can't go past there's red tape you can't pass unless they say so mm-hmm. with entrepreneurship it's not like that it's like whatever you want you can go get as long as you go get it Facts. you talk about entrepreneurship like a lot of times single people talk about it where it's like entrepreneur whatever you build is your baby and then right. you get to see it like crawl and then you get to see it walk and stuff mm-hmm. um do you also have kids Yes. Got okay, you. Yeah. So, and I know we talked a little bit about it, but um, <clears throat> how would you compare? Because you just talked about it, and mm. I resonated from like my baby, my my business is my baby. But how mm. would you compare fatherhood to like you starting your business fresh? Mm. That's a good question. 
<laughs> um, it's very similar, I guess. It's similar in the aspect in the aspect that you know your 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 child. You want to rear them as best as you can, and you want them to be as successful as possible. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with your entrepreneur baby. You want you want to give everything to it and um, give everything you can to it and see it prosper and see it succeed and and of course also you want it to bring you some good results whether that be from a child a good result of me being proud uh, of my, my my children doing something that that's awesome and great and just something that a father would be proud of and then also you know entrepreneurship is um, you know seeing that the monetary return or the even just the return of you seeing that you can do something you can accomplish something that you really never thought you could yeah and i've i've recently started to see that um in the past couple of years since i've been an entrepreneur it's just kind of you know you never really think you can do something and then you do it you're like dang i did that it's like man that was that's pretty dope yeah like i did a um i um i work a lot with with children so i'm a youth football coach and nice. i'm a high school football coach okay and so um a couple of years ago i started a league uh was was flag and 707 from ages 5 to 14 years old okay and you know i've been in the in the youth football space for a while since like 2013 my kid my kids were playing football and so i bought them out there and then i became kind of intertwined in all of it right and so i i was like man i can um you know provide the kids with this league and they can play flag in 707 and you know um set it all up so i'm i'm doing it i'm planning it you know hours and hours days and days months and months weeks and weeks and um you know the first tournament comes and i'm out there and it's like probably like 1500 people out there and i'm just like wow i did that are you still trying to get a leg up on your entrepreneurial career? Now I told you about the morning meetup, the community that was created for the betterment of entrepreneurship. And we are cooking up some really cool things. Now here's the thing, if you join today, you can actually get in for 60% of the original price. So if you join today, all you have to do is download the app and I provided the link below so that you can join us. We have community, we have a book club and it's the largest group that meets every single day, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. to literally get a head start on entrepreneurship. So if you're still trying to grow, you don't know what your business is going to be, but you know you want to be an entrepreneur, this is the community for you. So check out the morning meetup, click the link below, download the app and join us today. And it was like, it was, but for me, it was like confirmation, like, okay, this is something you can do. Yeah. And so the first year, like we had uh, maybe like 40 something teams. The next year we, had, we, we more than double. So this was last year. So this is my third season. So the second season we did, we had like 86 teams. And so this is our third year. And right now we're projecting to be over 100 teams. Are you serious? Yeah. So it's growing. That's that's growing exponentially. Now, the growth is lit, but the yeah. mindset shift from the moment you're able to create something, and put it out into the world. Right. I feel like that's what a lot of us resonate, like yeah. entrepreneurs resonate with. Yeah. So if we take it back before you were an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. before you were a petty officer, mm -hmm. When you were younger and kind of like figuring it out, I'm not even sure where you want to start in terms of like how you, when did you start thinking about a career in a sense like, okay, I got to get a job? Uh, yeah. So I was adopted. Hmm. So uh, my uncle and my aunt kind of, um, they, they adopted me and brought me down to Atlanta. I was living in New York at the time. I was in group homes and foster homes and um, detention centers and things like that. So how old were you when you were adopted? Uh, 13. Okay. Gotcha. 13. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I came here and then I, uh, graduated, I went, I came here as a, as a sophomore in high school. So I did 10th, 11th and 12th grade in at Morrow, Morrow high school. Nice. Nice. So, um, so yeah, so before I was adopted, I was, I was living in the hood. I was in the project. So it was never, you know, I was doing things I wasn't supposed to be doing, you know, hustling, whatever to make a dollar right so at that you know that mindset was totally different from when i was brought to atlanta uh, my aunt and uncle like i said adopted me and for the first time i had like a house to live in my own room mm -hmm. and for the first time i had like a father figure in my life a, a mother figure in my life my, my siblings and it was like a real family habitat 
And so I saw what it was like to be a father, a husband, a, br- a sibling, yeah. you know, so and my, my dad, my uncle, who I consider my dad now, and my, um, he, he did 20 years in the Army. Okay. So he retired from the Army um, and he was a um, sergeant major in the Army. He actually worked um, in the Pentagon, so he used to work for the for the chief of staff. So he was oh. real. Leadership he was level. up there, yeah. He mm-hmm. was up there. He was, did all the he did he did IT work. Gotcha. Um, and you know, now that I'm thinking about it, it's funny because, and I don't even think I've thought about this before. But we're talking about the transition. Well, my father, when he when he retired from the army, then he went to corporate. And so I did the same thing. Natural right? progression. <laughs> Listen. I didn't even think of, I never thought about that before. It's but crazy how that happens. Yeah. So he did IT. He was an, he worked in IT mm-hmm. um, in the army, retired, and then he became um, one of the first black vice presidents at Chick-fil-A corporate headquarters. Really? Mm-hmm. In Atlanta? In Atlanta. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Duh. Off of uh, mm-hmm. Buffington Road. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. So he was like one VP of, the, of what? VP. Uh, so he was the vice president. Uh, he was in charge of the call center. Okay. So whatever, if you if anybody called, like if your cash register was messing up or your computers are messing up or your anything IT wise, yeah. in, all around the nation, Chick Fil A's, he ran the call center for That's that dope. At, here in Atlanta. That's dope. So and he did that for years. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you think about it, growing up, do you feel like you went into the military because like off of straight influence, or do you think that's what he? Um, wanted you to do and impressed um, on you. It was yeah, so so that was a big part of it. Like um, you know, um at the time I was tired of school. I was like, I don't wanna go to school no more. I didn't want to go to college. And um I was like, I gotta do something else. So I was I, initially I was gonna go to um the art institute to be a chef. I nice. wanted to be a chef. And um just one day a Navy recruiter called me and it was like, hey, what do you plan on doing after you graduate? And I was like, well, I'm going to go to the Art Institute. I want to be a chef, uh, blah, 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 blah. And he was like, well, you know, you know, we, we'll send you to school for free and, you know, this and that. And I was like, hmm. And then, of course, my, my dad had been in the military for 20 years. So I'm like, you know, let me try it. Gotcha. And so I tried it and, and, and joined and um, I ended up doing 10 years. And it was it was fun. I traveled the world. Um, I've seen the world. I've been on every continent except Antarctica. So mm. I was able to step foot on every continent. Except Nobody Antarctica. is really in Antarctica though, right? Nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> as far as we know. It's, right. You yeah, know, yeah, you yeah, know yeah. how, you know. Yeah, there's a conspiracy mm-hmm. theories now out there, but yeah, I, yeah, I've never, I don't know who's out there. Got you. So when it comes yeah. to like, so I'm from a background where what was taught to me was like people go to to the military when they don't have options Mm -hmm. and i don't know a lot of people who like were second generation military right Mm -hmm. i know a lot of people who were like escaping the the life that they lived yeah so like from your perspective did you see the military how did you see it like okay i'm gonna get in there i'm gonna climb the ranks or i need this because of those free perks you know like i I get to go to the get the yeah um no, I kind of, I kind of, like I said, part of it was an ode to my father, like, kind of mm-hmm. like, I want to kind of continue this going on. Um, part of it was, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I wasn't escaping anything, though. Mm-hmm. But um, once I got in, like, I had this, I had this real big uh, thing. I wanted to be a Navy SEAL, right? So I'm like, I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. I was in shape. I was like, you know, I was like, I'm, do- I'm about to be a Navy SEAL. I'm about to go, like, play Call of Duty in real life, like. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> so I get the boot camp and, um, you know, when, you, when you're in boot camp and you tell them that you want to be a Navy SEAL, they send you to this like other uh, like a, like an extra training that you do. So after you're doing all the crazy stuff you're doing during boot camp, yeah. they send you to like this other training to get you ready to go to school for the SEALs. Right. And in this thing, you got to do just weird, crazy stuff like tread water for like an hour and like it's like just do group activities and do a lot of running and Mm push-ups and sit-ups and all this kind of stuff and then a lot of it's in the water too because they want you to be able to be you know be able to survive in the water and you know things like that so um and I always thought I was a good swimmer but then I was like doing all that stuff I was like man I don't like this as much as I thought I like I would Mm -hmm. like and not not the like the shape part not being in shape part about it because I felt like that was good it was more like the water part for me and I'm a real good swimmer but we had they had us doing some crazy stuff yeah I was like I thought I was gonna die (laughs) but I was gonna ask you right before you went through the the details Mm -hmm. what's the difference between like a navy seal and like a marine 
Uh, and then, like, as you start talking about the training, it sounds yeah. even closer and closer and closer. Like, nah, the so the Navy SEALs are the most elite fighting force in the world. Mm. Like, they're, like, you talk, when you're a Navy SEAL, you're, like, the top of the top. There's only, like, I don't know, like, 3% of people, like, in the world can be, like, have made it to be a Navy SEAL. Oh, wow. It's, it's like, the top. Like, you have, like, um, like, the Army has its special forces, which is the Green Berets. Um, the, uh, the Marines has their special forces, which is, uh, I don't know what it's called. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then and the, the Navy's, the Navy's special forces is the SEALs. And the, and in terms of, this might be getting too deep, deep into the weeds, but in terms of like the ASVAB, mm -hmm. when you score the highest, like is the Navy the highest or is the Air Force the highest? Air Force, the force highest? is the highest. Yeah, the gotcha. highest requirement, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the highest requirement, I believe, is the Air Force. Got you. Yeah. But the Navy SEALs is the highest of the highest in terms of... In terms of like what they do like um like for instance the people who caught bin laden mm, Navy SEALs. okay the people who go on all these secret missions and doing like they so secret you don't even know what they be doing because they <laughs> they be out there just yeah. yeah so i was like i'm gonna be a navy seal and, blah, 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 and nah and you made the decision not to so it was the water yeah that was the big part i, I, I just remember being in class or this extra training session, and it was like four of us, and we had to, we're treading water in like this deep pool. Mm -hmm. You can't touch the bottom, it's like 13 feet. Mm -hmm. And we had a cinder block in the middle of us, and it was four of us, and we had to just tread water holding this cinder block. For, I, it seemed like hours. Mm -hmm. It probably wasn't hours, but at the time I was like, I'm gonna die. Yeah. Like, I was like, yeah, I, I can't do it no more. Got you. So I was just like, yeah. but, and then they tell you, like, if you can't pass this, like, you're not gonna pass the, the actual Navy SEAL school that you got to go to, which is called BUDS, Basic Underwater Demolition School, Okay. after boot camp. Mm -hmm. So this is like where you got to go through all kind of crazy stuff. But really, a lot of the things that you do to become a SEAL, it's probably like 99.9% .9 mental. So at that time, I was just like a young hothead, like, man, I'm not doing this, like, you know. So technically, the mental, you weren't necessarily mentally prepared. I wasn't, I wasn't mentally prepared at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you, when you think about, like, so not even think about what, what, what was it like to, like, you built up this momentum to go towards being a Navy SEAL. Mm -hmm. So now that you decide, I don't want to do it anymore, how did you get, get off of the, the train track? You just tell them you don't want to do it anymore. And they're just like, cool. Because, yeah, because, yeah, I mean, they, they know that people are going to say they want to do it, and they're not going to cut it. So I just didn't cut it. Like, and that's, like I said, it's like 3% of people do cut it. So it's like, for them, it's like, it weeds people. It's expected. It's people, yeah, it's expected. Mm. People weed themselves out. Okay. Some people make it to, you know, bud school and don't make it through bud school because mm -hmm. it's too intense or whatever the case may be. But, um, but they, they, like I said, it's expected. So, I got you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So you decide you didn't want to do it and you're getting ready to do another pivot. So your first pivot so like how what did you decide to do and, and then like how far along um, in your military journey were you before you decided to not go to the navy seals well the sea well so that's this boot camp right so this is i had just joined the military so oh this is like not during, even you don't even have a pick a tray a track yet well what i had picked my, my track was to be a chef i took my asvab a cook a cook in the navy okay. so i took my asvab um, I scored really good on my ASVAB. Mm -hmm. If I would have known, I didn't know anything about the military back then besides going. But if I'd have known, I probably would have joined the Air Force, honestly. Because I, I had a, a really good score in the ASVAB and, and I probably could have cho chosen any other job yeah. than to be a cook, mm -hmm. right? But I was like, I, I was set on my mind, like I want to be a chef and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to oppress women and all this stuff. <laughs> like I, was, I had it all, that's what I'm I mapped out. I'm glad you shared it to <laughs> <laughs> the like, motivation. Was, yeah, it was all, oh yeah, oh yeah. I was a lover boy. I but, uh, so I was like, um, you know, I, I wanted to be a cook or whatever. So I joined Navy. So during boot camp is when they, like, you're in boot camp for eight weeks. So that's when they send you to the training. Because right after boot camp, if you want to be a SEAL, that's when you go to basic under, that's when you go to bud school. Okay. So they prepare you during boot camp. So like I said, while you're doing all your crazy stuff for boot camp, you also have to be preparing for SEAL Seals. school. Mm -hmm. Right. So, mm -hmm. so that was pretty, that was early in the beginning where okay. I was like, ah, I'm not going to do this. Okay. So, um, finished boot camp and then went to school, um, in San Antonio, uh, um, the culinary school. Okay. You finished, you finished boot camp mm -hmm. and then you were stationed in San Antonio. And no, I wasn't stationed. No. I, so I was sent to San Antonio for school. So before you get stationed somewhere, you got to learn your job. Okay. So boot camp is like your initial, 
um, introduction to the military. Like you're getting all your shots, you're getting all your uniforms, you're getting all your everything. You know, you're, you're you're getting your physical fitness ready, making sure you're good with all of that and all the. You know, you're learning how to march and you're learning all the. Mm-hmm. It's like how to be. Yeah, yeah. how yeah. to be in the military. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're learning the, <laughs> the creed and the the rules and all this stuff. You're learning. Got gotcha. you. So then, once you're done with that, then you have to go learn your job. So ask, that's called A school. So after I would, you know, after boot camp, I went to A school, which was in Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, and that was maybe like I don't know six weeks or something like that. And it's just kind of like a crash course on um, cooking and garnish and um, food safety, um, that kind of stuff. Nice. So it kind of is on the chef chefy side. It, you know, it's on the chefy side, but I mean. Mm-hmm. It, it, it and you know I got better through the years and I actually went to chef school to like get my chef degree or mm-hmm. certification. What would you say the difference in like what you learn in the military chef school versus mm-hmm. like in your true like culinary arts certification? The the amount of people you cook for. Okay. So like cooking for like cooking for like two people for dinner is so much more like you can be so much more extravagant and precise and you know just it. You know, but when you're cooking for, when you're in the Navy, you're on a ship and there's 300 people on your ship, and you got to cook for 300 people. It's like, the whole year. <laughs> <laughs> you throw, you, exactly. <laughs> a big pot like that. And, you know, it's like, so that, the style is different. Like, cooking for a lot of people versus cooking for, you know, an intimate setting of people or one person or, you know, a family. Let's say a family. Mm, a single family. Mm-hmm. Single house family. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, it's just totally different. So, mm. um, so yeah, I you know after school, after uh, my A school in, in San Antonio, um, I got stationed in Honolulu, Hawaii. Nice. So I was on a ship in Hawaii, and I was there for five years. Got you. Did you get a chance to cook for both um, large audiences and small audiences? Yes, because I, I actually got really good at cooking, and like my so I got um, I became a personal chef to an admiral. Nice. Yeah. So I was I kind of got taken off of the ship that I was working on. Mm-hmm. And I, I became like a personal chef to an admiral of the uh, South, let's see, the South Pacific, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and his name was Admiral Alexander, good guy. So, um, you know, I used to cook for him and he used to, so he used to host, when you're an admiral, you host like a lot of like foreign dignitaries and um, celebrities and um, all kind of like these nice, lavish luncheons and dinners and banquets and stuff so yeah. I did a lot of that stuff is that an appointed position or did they like say oh we need Brandon like yes yeah, so, yeah so so what happened was um oh, I can't remember how it exactly happened but I, I, I met this guy that was the admiral's chef at the time mm-hmm. and he was throwing a banquet for I think it was like the Japanese Navy or something like that mm-hmm. and he, he asked for some people to help I volunteered to help and went from then on, it was kind of Admiral Alexander met me, his wife met me, and then his wife kind of requested that I come back and help. So after that banquet, it was like his wife wanted me to come like help with that stuff. So I would like, anytime there was a function or anything like that, they would call me and we would do like these big spreads and just, you know, just, and in Hawaii, everything is like flowers and luau's and um, you know, the necklaces and yeah, the hula girls. Yeah, yeah. And it was fire. Lays. Yeah, lays, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, lays, yeah and fire people and all that kind of stuff. So we would do like That's banquets amazing. like that and it was dope. That's cool. Um, so so at this point, it doesn't, like people's biggest fear of going to the military is like the war part. How oh yeah, far is know. like war from your mind in this, in this um, moment? Not, no way. You weren't the, <laughs> you just living. No, it's, a, it's, it's like a regular <laughs> job. Like it was like a regular nine to five job with the ability, the, the I mean, it's like, it was like a nine to five job. I mean, yeah. I mean, I can't even. I mean, they did. We, we, you know, I can't. I can say we worked a lot. Like I worked hours and hours. Like I remember there were times we were going through like inspections and stuff, mm-hmm. where we would have to work like eighteen hour days. It was crazy. Like we, ugh, those days suck. But mm-hmm. you know, and then being like when you're on deployment on the ship out to sea, like I've been like out to sea for like seventy eight days straight, no land in sight. Gotcha. And it's just like a floating prison. It's like you wake up, you work. You eat, try to work out, try to have a little bit of fun somewhere, but it's yeah. like, you can't go anywhere. Yeah, yeah. You're on a boat. It's you ocean. say a floating prison, and, and you know how much people love um, 
Um, of cruises? Yeah, yeah. I hate, I, not that I hate yeah. cruises, but like I kind of feel like if I had to wake up every day on the same boat, yeah. go to the same front or the back of the boat, and then <laughs> go back to my little room, I think I would. But see, I like the cruises that take you to different places. Like I've only been, I've only been on, I think on maybe two cruises, mm -hmm. and then both of them went to the Bahamas. But there's cruises you can go on like that'll take you like to a bunch of different Five ports. different yeah, locations. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I, I want I would like to try that. So like these, like in the in the Navy on these deployments, like I I went to like islands and like Fiji and uh, Mauritius and Seychelles and like islands you people don't ever even hear of, but they're like yeah. gorgeous. Mm. Like just yeah like that makes me want to join the navy just because <laughs> like it was like yeah i've been to some beautiful like places and like places in the philippines like not even a lot of people there yeah. and malaysia and thailand and mm -hmm. singapore hong kong everywhere australia like I've, i'm sorry but i've got i've got to like i said i've got to see a lot of different places and that was probably the best thing that i can take saying that I that I experienced in the military was the amount of places I've got to see the amount of the different cultures I've been exposed to and understanding like it was it was crazy because we'd be in we would go our, our job like when we would go would be you go out in a group like all, all these ships go out in a group right and it's to show them the might of the Navy got right it. Mm -hmm. so it's like a show of power but the ships break off and they go to different ports and they they do like humanitarian efforts and like help we helped uh you know build desks for classrooms and help paint churches and stuff like we'd help yeah. we'd, we'd get off and help and do stuff like that and um but you would go to like some of these countries and some of these places beautiful beautiful places island nations and whatever and you'd see the people living in huts barefoot always smiling on their face mm. like always happy and so I'm, you know, I'm always thinking to myself, like, man, I got to bet America, I got to worry about these bills. I got to worry about this. Make sure my credit's good. Mm -hmm. I got to make sure, blah, blah, blah. You know, all this stuff is taken care of. I'm like, these people living on this island. Happy. And you got no shoes. Yeah. Living in a hut. Kids running around just joyous. Everybody's joyous. just joyous. That's like, a great way. To like, like, just, like, not a care in the world. Like, this is how they live. Like, they got to work to eat. Or maybe they got a farm or a little farm and maybe they got a goat or a couple animals, yeah. but like they're happy, genuine happiness, not like fake. I'm putting on this fake smile to be happy like this. They're, they're genuinely happy. Or maybe, even materialistic happy. It, oh, or materialistic happy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's just like the happiness is not in what they had, like what, what they possess. Mm -hmm. It's like in, it's just in themselves and like their family and it's just, it was a different kind it was a different vibe for me like a whole different like an eye-opening experience for me because at this time i'm like 18 19 years old i'm young yeah. so i'm experiencing the world and i'm like man this is crazy it's like you I, you don't even know like now that if you knew what you know now you don't even know what you're seeing mm -hmm. so because I, I was what i was going to ask you is or what i was going to say i realized on one end you're you're giving dinner to the admiral mm -hmm. right in this very high position and then you also get a chance to see life on the other side of the spectrum right. so it's like you're getting this very grounded exposure in a yeah. way that a lot of 18 year olds don't get a chance to do that right and you stayed there for 10 years, 10 years so like ago. over the last over the 10 years that you were there was mm -hmm. everything essentially like those three parts like cook for the emerald life on the boat get exposure to like so, the so the fir my first five years I was in um, in Hawaii mm -hmm. stationed on a ship it was uh, Reuben James mm -hmm. and then I got stationed in Jacksonville Florida on another boat um, in Mayport Florida which is Jacksonville Florida just down the bay on the bay side of it okay. and um, so I was there for maybe two years on that second ship. And then after after that, my ship time was done. And so I, I went to shore duty. Okay. So that's when I went to Naval Air Station Jacksonville and I worked on the base galley. So they had a, like, you know, a, a base kitchen, like okay. chow hall. I was gonna ask. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So like where the, like anybody that's on the base, like stationed on the base, mm -hmm. where they come eat during the day. Okay. So like all the officers, all the enlisted, everybody comes there and eats. 
and um and we so we had two places we had the the, the base kitchen and then we had like the 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 barracks which is like where everybody lives at mm -hmm. which is like it's like a, a hotel pretty much with rooms where everybody lives on okay. base mm -hmm. you know unless you have a family you live out in town and this and that and i had like i had my son and so i had my own apartment in town you had your son at this point yeah so i, I had my son my son was born i was 21 so okay. yeah so that was was it to you know filipino no, no, hotty no, 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 no. <laughs> toddy <laughs> No, no, that's funny though, yeah. When did, yeah, cause so you know, a lot my, of my, my, my first son's mother, we met, uh, I'd known her from, from New York from like when we were kids. Mm -hmm. And like her family knew my family. It was like, you know, it was a... It was already, yeah, it was just, you yeah. guys were friends and then you guys ended up, okay, yeah, got you. Yeah, and it's, yeah, so... So you had your son mm -hmm. and you went from cooking for the Admiral to cooking in the galleys right. back to like mass, mass meal Well, Well, kind of what happened was, so it was funny, so after I left Hawaii and I went to the boat in Jacksonville, then I got to uh, the shore duty on Jacksonville, um, I was, I was at some, some like function on base and guess what I see? The Admiral. Admiral Alexander yeah, and his wife and they're like now they had moved from Hawaii now he's the Admiral of Southeast the Southeast region so basically the boss here and he's like I need you to I knew it was so coming. I started doing the same thing yeah okay so you didn't even have to worry about how, right. how long were you doing the galleys um, before before he came, yeah, uh, I, mean, I don't know, maybe a year or something like that. I can't remember. Did you hate it, or was it was it like? No, yeah, I cool. mean, yeah, it was just it was just a, it's just a job. Okay, like it's just a job. Like it's just um, you know, it's cooking. And at that time, I was like, I had made rank pretty fast, so I was an E five at the time. So I was like middle management. I was like, um, not like a C I was a manager basically. Okay. I wasn't like a senior manager, but I was like a manager. Got you. If you were to equate it to like corporate. Yeah, Stats. and I think that's important. Right. So, like, when you think about middle it, management, okay, what skill? Like, you did it for ten years, and and you mm -hmm. got it. You went from you know am admiral to mass, and then back mm -hmm. to the admiral, which was like save. Mm -hmm. But I guess it wasn't even like save me because you were pretty cool where you were at. Yeah, going through that process, starting mm -hmm. at eighteen and mm -hmm. being twenty eight when you left, what's like some of the biggest things that you learned about yourself being in that role? How to deal with people, mm. um, how to deal with, um, how to be customer service oriented, um, leadership on, you know, how to get people to do kind of what you need them to do. And because, um, you know, at that time, like you become a manager, I might, I might have been a manager at 20 and I'm managing people who are 18, 19. Right. So mm -hmm. they're still kids. We're all kids. Uh, right. Right. So we're all still kids. But it's like. So they still are doing stuff like slacking off and, you know, whatever. So it's like, you know, how do you bring them together and get them to, you know, accomplish this common goal? And, you know, for a long time, like my my mentor, when I first came in, good friend of mine, still a really good friend of mine, um, like he he was like a jerk. Like if I made something that wasn't good, he'd be like, what is this crap? And he would like throw it and like, the whole Hell's Kitchen. Yeah, he like yeah, but, it, it, but he's black and he's this big Jamaican dude. Gotcha. Right? Like, what is this crap? And he throw like my stuff on the floor. I'm like yo, man, like <laughs> chill out. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> Sick so, it easy. Yeah, and uh, but it like it gave me like a whole like I don't, I don't it, it gave me the mentality to not put out no nonsense. Okay. Like so everything that I did like people would love it. And I think that's how I got started working for the admiral because i got recommended to this guy like yo this you know this is one of our good you know cooks here on the boat he does really good work blah 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 take him you know kind of groom him under your wing and it was funny because after when i started doing the the uh the admiral working for the admiral again in jacksonville is when i got sent to culinary school from the military because okay. they now they like yo you are doing this we're gonna send you to school gotcha so they actually sent me and pay for me to go get my culinary certification. So I'm actually a certified chef de cuisine, which is like a step under an executive chef. Really? Yeah. And in the civilian world, what does that translate to? That's what it translates. That's that's civilian. Oh. I went to civilian school. And so you could do. You could have done that when you when you left. Right. But you I could have done that. But no, they paid for me to do it while I was in. Mm. So like it was free for me, and it was that's lit. first coast first coast technical college first first coast technical institute. 
I got my chef certification. And when, when I got my chef certification, the master chief that was running like that program recommended that I go um, interview to be Joe Biden at the time was the vice president to go interview to be Joe Biden's personal chef. And so I went and submitted my package and all that. I was like, at this point, I was like, yo, I'm about to be the greatest like black chef in the world. Yeah. Like, and I'm about to have all the women and like, yo, this it's is the second time you mentioned I'm, women. <laughs> Listen, I gotta see your vision board because you got you somewhere in there. You you got a picture yeah. of like these. This like a group of women. Yo, it was. I was like, yo, I'm. I, I, I'm. If as David, he'll tell you. Like, I called him like, yo, I'm about to go interview for Joe Biden, and I'm telling my uncle and my, my dad and my every time. Everybody. I'm like, I'm about to go interview with Joe Biden. And um, at the time, at the time, it was crazy because my son, um, he was living with his mother at the time. She was living in North Carolina. Mm. And um, um, he uh, he was like, his behavior was kind of starting to act up a little bit. And um, I was missing a lot of stuff. Like I was missing his birthdays. I was missing Christmas. I was just missing stuff. And um, so I went to go interview for the Joe Biden job. And they were telling me, you know, he has uh, four personal chefs that are that work with him, right, for him. And um, basically, it's like you'll be expected to be out of the country for like about 15 days out of the month. Okay. So like half of the month, you're going to be gone because Joe Biden, vice president, does a lot of traveling and, yeah. um, you know, um, what do you call it? Uh, like just traveling and talking to all these other leaders while the president kind of he does, too. But it's kind of he's more at home. He's at home more than the, the vice president. Got you. Okay. I didn't know that. And I'm realizing mm. we got a whole four years and mm. then that brings us to like, that's eight years though. That's not 12 years ago between like the last, when was, what year was this? Cause I'm realizing. I joined, I joined the military in 2004. Okay. So this is for five, six, seven, eight, nine. Maybe 11, 2011, gotcha. 2010, 11. Mm -hmm. So what's that? Yeah, maybe nine years ago, something like that. I got you. Yeah. 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 Crazy nine, ten years flies. ago. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, they tell you you're going to have to move around. Yeah, vice so, president. So, yeah. So they're like, um, you know, there's four of y'all. You're going to be out of the country up to 15 days out of the month. Mm -hmm. And then when you're in CONUS, like when you're here um, in D.C., you're on call 24-7. So to me, it was like, oh, man. Like, I'm going to be away from my son more. And I just kept thinking about it. I kept thinking about it. I kept thinking about it. And I was like, I don't know. And at this and it to, so I got offered the job. And then to, to get it, I would have had to re-enlist for like another four years or six years or something like that. And I was just like, I remember when I was, I was, I was standing outside and I came uh, into the barracks where I was working. And I told my boss, she just she just passed away recently. Her name was Miss Nix. Real real nice lady. We all loved her. Condolences. And um I was like, Miss Nix, I just had an epiphany. She was like, What epiphany? Black, you know, she's like our black mama bear. <laughs> she and she was a civilian, but she was over the barracks. She was a GS thirteen, like a government service gotcha. worker. Yeah. And so I was like, I had an epiphany, Miss Nix. She was like, What? I was like, I'm getting out. She was like, No, you're not. I was like, I'm getting out. And nobody would believe me. Everybody was like, "Yeah, no way. Like you stay, you you're halfway there. Like why would you? Because after 20 years, I was gonna say you retire, you get your pension, you yeah. get blah 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 all this. And I'm like, I, I gotta, I gotta, I can't do it no more. And it wasn't like it was, it was, it, it was like a lot of things at once. It was like the stuff with my son, um, me feeling kind of, you know, um, kind of resent resentful of military life and like how they um how you can get stuck in one place until it's time until they say you can move up yeah. okay now you can move up oh, not, not too much though not too fast just take one step stay right there just wait that's how i felt i was being handled gotcha. and i felt like i'm like i'm doing all this stuff and if i would have went to the if i would took the joe biden job i probably would have advanced much much faster right but um, like I said, at the time, I was like, man, I need to spend more time with my son. And I'm like, so I just I decided to get out. But before that, you had the feeling. So before the, the Joe Biden job, mm -hmm. what was what, what it was an instance that said, OK, well, I could move up, but they want me to stay right here. Like, was it working for the admiral for a little longer than no, you needed to? No, nah, it was just kind of like that's how the military is. Like mm -hmm. um, like you can. So in order to advance in the military, in the Navy anyway, 
you have to take a test and then you have to have a, a performance evaluation that is better than the rest of the people in the Navy. Like, oh. not in the Navy, but um, like they only have a certain amount of slots that they can allow advancement for okay. in the total Navy. Okay. In your job. So like, let's just say my job as a cook, right? And I, at the time I was an E5, I wanted to make it to E6, which is first class petty officer, which is like senior manager. Right. So I want to be, now I'm I'm manager. I'm managing my group of people or whatever, my, my, my stuff. And I want to now become like the senior manager. And then above the senior manager, you got like the VP and then, the, you know, stuff mm-hmm, like that. Mm-hmm. So I want to be a senior manager. But they're like, well, you can't take the test yet because you got to do this amount of time first. Unless you get an evaluation, a, a performance evaluation that says you can um, take it early. Okay. Right. So anyway, it's just all this. It's kind I understand. Of nuances. Red tape. Yeah, red, red tape. Red tape. Bureaucracy around yes. your career moves. So now yeah. I'm starting to understand it. And just a, a quick connection. You do a really good job of like explaining the the roles in the military and mm-hmm. then also translating them yeah. to like the civilian world. Mm-hmm. Before you actually made that leap, though, were you very clear on no. like how to explain your job to the civilians? Nah, nah. I what learned that it. like. I learned it all. So it was so when I decided I was going to get out the military yeah. mm-hmm. and I knew that I was getting out, like I had all my ducks in a row. I went to like these classes because the military will give you like um, like a fair, like farewell classes, like what to because they know a lot of people come into the military, they come in as a kid. Like you don't know civilian life right. at all. Yeah. Yeah. Like so you got to get adjusted to everything. And a lot of <clears throat> a lot of um, people that do get out, like don't succeed or they they struggle really bad and but they they it's just there's so many programs that the military has to help you yeah. and to me like if if people don't if people get out of the military and they don't succeed like they just they didn't, didn't use yeah they didn't mm. use what they had because mm-hmm. military they give you like all these classes mm. all these resources mm-hmm. um and then the fact that you have this military experience when you're going into the civilian sector it's like you have experience at so for me i've got mid-level yes. management experience and you're in like for mid-20s 10 years. yes right. and i'm 25 years old right. right so i'm like so so if i'm yeah. a 25 year old coming out of college mm-hmm. i've got way more oj on the job training than this regular college kid that's coming out of 24 25 yes right it's just that if you don't know how to spin it then you get lost in the you, sauce you get lost in the sauce so mm-hmm. it was um so i remember I was getting I was working nights at the barracks. I was working overnights and just checking people in and out of the barracks or whatever. Mm -hmm. And all night I would just be on a computer filling out resumes. I mean, filling out uh, applications, Mm -hmm. submit my resume. Mm -hmm. Boom, 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 just everywhere. And I left the military on a Friday. Like that was my last day. It was like Friday, May something. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. I left the military Friday. I had a job starting on Monday. You already had your job lined up at the W Midtown as a banquet chef. Let's go. So I, um, I, I was working at as the a banquet chef at the W Midtown Atlanta. I was doing like bri- uh, bridal parties, br- uh, birthday par- big corporate. I was doing. Now I'm like a civilian chef. Like yeah. I'm really yeah. like doing it. Yeah. And then um, so the, the issue that happened with that was. I had told the guy, the, the executive chef at the time, that I wanted, I was going to be starting school soon, and um, so he was like, "Oh, it's okay. We'll work around your schedule, this and that." So okay, I was like, I was like, okay. So I started school. Well, I got my schedule for school. I'm going to Clark Atlanta University, right? Nice. And um, so I bring my schedule back to the chef. I'm like, "Look, chef, you know, this is, I'm gonna be in school in the morning time from like nine to I don't know two o'clock or something like that. Boom, I can come back. I can come here and work." Well, what if I need you for this and that? I'm like, you told me yeah. that you was gonna work around my schedule. Like, I, here's my schedule. Yeah, I'm bringing it to you. Yeah. And he's like, I don't know if the, I don't. He's like, I might need you for this. You know. He's like, you know how our schedule gets and this and that. And I was like, I was like, you can just have me work these set hours at nighttime, you know, and I can prep, you know, all the stuff that you guys will need during the, the day. Any daytime banquets. Mm-hmm. And you know, we had nighttime banquets as well. So it's like. I'll be there for those. Yeah, yeah. But I can prep for the ones that are during the day. You know, you have these these like, big luncheons or anything like that. I'm like, and I can prep. Before this, you were doing the full shift. Yeah, I was doing. Well, I mean, I was I was doing it like, um, yeah, I was. I don't know if I was on like hourly or was I? I was on salary. So I was like, I was like, 
per I was doing whatever banquet we needed I was working gotcha. that banquet like so you, know you were saying? around when he wanted you around correct got you correct. and he was like oh I'm gonna have to right mm -hmm. right so he's mm -hmm. like now nah, I gotta put you on this set I'm like well this is I, I told you about this got gotcha. you and he was like um well I don't know if that's gonna work and I was like well I don't think it's gonna work either so um I stopped working at the W and then I was just a full-time college student that's not the full-time college student might be life but I was thinking about your your journey like applying 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 and then you get a job mm -hmm. how many like how long did it take for you to apply not long dang there was there it was, was because of the programs Yes, that's what I was about to say, because there's like, you can go, uh, they have like these websites that you can go on, mm -hmm. like HireVets.com and um, just, uh, there's so many things that you just put your resume in there and they send it out to all these companies that are looking for somebody who's in the military who has military experience because you're going to have a certain, cer unless you're just a total dirt bag of a person, you're going to pick up some things in the military. Mm -hmm. You're going to be orderly. You're going to be on time. You're going to be respectful. They know you're going to be shaved and well kept. And you know what I'm saying? Just mm -hmm. that's just the, because the that's what you do in the military. Groomed you wake a, up, mm -hmm. you shave, you, you make you can't come. You can't have braids. You can't have as a man. Mm -hmm. You can't have, you know, just different hairstyles. You're going to be fit. They know you're going to be on time. Yeah, yeah. There's just certain things that you get from a person who's been in the military, especially a person that's been there for 10 years. Yeah. You pick up some things. You can't not like I said, unless you're just a total. Like you said dirt, dirt bag. bag. Yeah, you're just like, uh, you Cause know. Some, and then I think you probably would get you would have gotten kicked, kicked out, out before right. ten years. Exactly. So you are a full time college student, -time grown college man. Student. Grown you man. Know, I'm like mind. twenty. I'm like twenty six, twenty seven, maybe. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm in college, right? And um, I'm like, all everybody's like eighteen, nineteen, <laughs> right? So I'm like Uncle Big. Mm -hmm. So I'm like holding study sessions and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like the, the dude like that's in the class, sitting in the front of the class with my, my glasses, like right, down, yes. raising my hair for everything. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, 4.0. Funny thing is, you didn't even want to go back to school. Like you, it sounds like you got this new love for going back to school. Yo, so, so crazy. So remember I told you like when I graduated high school, I was like, I'm, not, I'm tired of school. Right. I don't want to write no papers. I don't want no homework. I go to school as a grown man. I'm loving it. I'm like, yo, this is the best thing ever. I'm loving it. I'm like, I'm like I said, I, my first, my first year, like 4.0 GPA. Like I'm killing it. Yeah. I'm not going to no parties. I'm not. I don't care about none of that. Like I've done all. Mm -hmm. Like y'all party at the frat house. Like I've been partying in Singapore and Hong Kong and like that ain't nothing to me. So I'm like, yeah. all of that is like, I'm just focused. And everybody's looking at me like, dang, he's. So my teachers, so my, my professors, they're like all noticing me, like I'm getting these good grades and they know I'm older. They know I was in the military. I'm real, you know, helping them out, being kind of aides and stuff, like doing study sessions and things like that. And um, so I start getting sent to like represent the school in different functions. Like if we're doing like, um, I was on the um, case competition team. To where we, like debate kind of thing? Yeah, like, well, debate, like, I was a business student, so mm. so it's like they give you a case study on, like, a, a certain business uh, scenario. Like, um, one of the ones we did was, like, at the time, Under Armour was kind of, like, trying to um, expand and, and, and grow globally uh, more. And it was, like, think of uh, some, some ways you could help this company um, expand and, and, mm -hmm. and gain as much market share as like Nike and Adidas yeah. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And we would, you know, me and my team would come and do a presentation and we would, you know, we'd go to like National Black NBA Conference and like the, my school, like Clark Atlanta, like pushed me out there. Nice. So they were like, this is one of my, you know, one of our star kids and they would push me out there and I'm there suited up, suited and booted and just, yeah, you know, 10 years military. So I go, I'm getting all these like um, offers to go intern at companies and stuff like that like because they see this young black man that's doing really well all my grades is good um, and I've got this experience and you know they're like so that I did an internship in Milwaukee like they paid for me um, to come out there and visit like before I was like I was I was real like 
I need this before I do it. Like, I was like, I just knew I was it. Like, So you were negotiating. Yes. You were, like, walking into these doors like, I am your man. Yes, because I had, like, I had, first of all, my school's backing me, yeah. right? And pe these people are coming to me. Like, I remember they sent me to this conference, and there was a guy, like, we were doing, like, these different workshops, and there was a guy there that was, like, proctoring the, the thing. He's, like, a VP of this company I ended up going to. I won't I won't mention the name, but this company that I went to go intern with in Milwaukee, okay. right? Mm-hmm black guy and so we know we're talking about stuff and uh, the 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 topic was like generational um um generational differences like between gen x and oh, um like uh, millennials, millennials baby, and boomers. baby boomers mm -hmm. yeah so we're all talking about this and you know of course everybody always says the millennials are you know the lazy generation and they don't want to get out there and work they think everything and, and I, I had a lot to say about that because although i'm a millennial mm -hmm. I still, I think I associate more with the blue collar, I guess it would be the baby boomer, because what's, what's the generation before us? It, I think it's X. Generation or it, X, whatever whatever one that is before us, okay. I'm not sure exactly what it is, Me but either. it's more, the one before us is more of like a blue collar, mm -hmm. um, you know, go to college, work hard, have your family, get your house, mm -hmm. blah, 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 you know, that was because when I was bought into my house, into Atlanta, that's what I was that's how I was raised. Right. So, and my my parent my my parents and their parents did the same thing. My grandparents are married like fifty something years. And as a millennial, you already have a ten year career. Right. You know, got you sped up through life. So that's we're going different. we're going through this workshop, and the guy's mm -hmm. like, um, he's just looking at me. And so afterwards, he's like, I want you to come intern at my company. And I was like, okay, what company are you with? And he tells me the company or whatever. And I was like, eh, Milwaukee. <laughs> and I was like, because I had another uh, company that wanted me to um, intern with them in Nebraska. And I'm like, Nebraska? That's, they pay well in those areas, though. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So I was like, I don't know. I was like, I was like, how about you fly me out there? And um, you <laughs> and, and, and I'll check it out for a weekend and see you if I like it. it. Really? Oh, yeah. That is so interesting. Oh, yeah. Like you and he taking like, these liberties. He he wanted me. It's not like it's not like I went to him. Like, hey, sir, please, can you find it in your heart to You're let right. me intern for you? No, I, I was so right. I was like the cream of the crop at the time. So I was so he flew me and my wife out there to this. Um, I remember because it was I think my wife was pregnant at the time. I think she was pregnant. Okay. And so they flew us out there for the weekend. Put us in a hotel showed us around like well took me and showed me around the company but you know took we showed my wife all around milwaukee it was snowing it was nice and what did they want you to do what role uh with the internship yeah the internship was like a internship was a um it was part of their supply so i was a supply chain management major so i was a business business management with a concentration in supply chain management mm. so supply chain management has different factors to it logistics um um, transportation, um, just there's different things that yeah, you can do. Retail, it's, yeah, 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 there's it's, so much. Supply chain is can be yeah, anything. Absolutely. So um, they they brought me in as a supply chain intern, and there was no there was no more slots to be to, for interns. Mm. Like he made me a slot. He's like, no, this I want this guy. Interesting. And uh, so he ended up. I ended up uh, going to Milwaukee for a whole summer and um, spending it there. And uh, actually, I had some good I had some good times in Milwaukee. I met, met a good friend of mine there, a dude named Chris. He was he was the guy that I uh, ended up getting the Airbnb, an Airbnb from him, and he was living there with me. So he had like a triplex, uh, you know, like three, you know, build three apartments. When in you it. say get the, you got the Airbnb from him, you like got it. So now you're um, selling like you that's your business. Or no, you no, got no, the no. I was just staying there. Live, I was okay. staying there. Yeah, just that's for the summer because I was trying to find like an apartment, mm -hmm. that I could sublet. Mm -hmm. Um, for the summer, just stay there for the summer. I didn't want to spend, you know, hotel would have been astronomical. I got you. So I'm like, okay, where can I stay? Um, you know, so I looked at Airbnb, ended up staying at his, at his, at his spot. Gotcha. Ended up being a brother. Um, it was so crazy because he was like the, like the most, like one of the most connected black guys in Milwaukee. So he introduced me to like Congress women. I'm going like, and you already that dude. And I'm like, you tell, you can I don't tell know how this stuff happens. Like, I don't know how it happens. <laughs> like, but, the, but the thing it's about crazy. it is, like, what's crazy about, yes, it is crazy. It's you are developing as a professional in your own little nucleus over here in the military. Mm -hmm. And you get, you get 
exposed. Like all you need is an exposure and yeah. people take to you. Yeah. That's the I dope guess. part. And then like having, I'm assuming, like I'm only assuming, but you gotta tell me, having a friend who is connected, well connected, and you it got was, this experience, y'all, I used to cook so for the weird. Admiral. It was so, it was like, I even tell him now, it's like, cause I talked to him, he's, so we're doing, he's doing, I bought him into government contract. Wow. So like, and this, he's older than me, he's like 50, he's 50. Yeah. He's 50 years old. Mm. Black guy, not married, no kids. Mm -hmm. Um, he, he owns a lot of real estate in um, Milwaukee and around uh, around the nation. He's got some properties. Now he's living in Dallas, but um, he's got busy. He's just a business. He was at the time he was like open. He was like a um, he was an entrepreneur at the time when I was living with him. But then he had got a job at this like all black bank or something like that. He was like, I remember he was doing that. And but it was just crazy how like like people like that magnetized to me. Yeah. Like I just meet people and then it's like, man. How did this happen? And then it's like, he was bringing me to people, like all these rich people's house in Milwaukee, like that owned these huge companies. And like, it was, it was crazy. Let me ask you, cause supply chain management is so far from culinary arts. When you think- Not that, really. That's why I'm gonna ask why I wanna know, like mm -hmm. where do you see the connection? Where do you draw that connection? Right, so in the military, so as a cook in the military, I didn't only just cook. Mm -hmm. So at times that you have to, there was a, there was times when I had to be the uh, it's called jack of the dust. Mm -hmm. So the jack of the dust is the person that orders all the food Got you. to inventory. be inventory, inventory management, mm -hmm. logistics, transportation, setting all that stuff up. Yes. So so I'm the one that has to like I've got the storerooms where all the food is. Yeah. I'm issuing it out to them yes. daily. Okay, we need more chicken for next week. Boom, boom, boom. I yeah. gotta, gotta order this. Yep. Um, we need bread. Whatever, whatever it was. I'm ordering all this kind of so supply chain was like it's all together. Absolutely. It, it, so, as soon as you said mm -hmm. like you you were the say it again. Dust. Jack of the dust. Jack of the dust. And yeah. you mentioned inventory. It mm -hmm. makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. So from your experience, because mm -hmm. my next question was gonna be what differentiated you from an experiential perspective mm -hmm. in that internship, whereas well one obviously Experience, a lot of people yeah. your age yeah. but then even with the people who've been in the office mm -hmm. a lot of times you could be 40 years old and never have experience being a yeah. jack of the dust yeah. right so yeah. when you noticed your like edge what did you realize your competitive edge was in that space so it was just knowledge like it was knowledge and exposure like mm -hmm. because like you said you could be and there were people that I met in my internship or at my corporate job that had been there for it. At, like since they graduated high school yeah. or graduated college, mm -hmm. they got in this job and they've been there for 30, 40 years. Yeah. And I was just like, wow. Mm -hmm. How do you stay there that long yeah. and just do that? There was one lady, she just retired. She was at Lockheed for like 40 years. Like that's all she ever knew was Lockheed Martin. And I was just like, I could never. And, um, but yeah, I, it was just like, so you go to these, you know, you, and th it's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. It's nothing wrong with that. She retired with a nice pension and, you know, she's, she's set, her and her husband are set. But I mean, I just couldn't see myself like doing that for the rest of my life until I don't work anymore. Yeah. And listening to your career though, um, at different junctures, you had the opportunity to mm -hmm. go up if you wanted to. You right. could have been a Navy SEALs if you wanted to. If I really would have tried. Yeah. Right. If mm -hmm. you if you really wanted to like uh, go work for Ob uh, Biden, mm -hmm. you could have if you wanted to. Right. And at these junctures in your life, you're like, okay, yeah, I, re <clears throat> I really don't want to. Like, I've, you made a decision yeah. for a, your life. Mm -hmm. So for you at this point, and even now, if you look back at it, are you more driven by um, the breath? of knowledge, did I say that right? Yeah, the breadth of knowledge as opposed to like the depth in a specific like area. Yeah, I don't I don't wanna get, um, I don't like to get too tied to something. Mm. Like I feel like my dynamic, I feel like my mind is dynamic. And like, here's what I feel like. I feel like I'm a problem solver, mm -hmm. right? I feel like I can see a problem and assess it in my mind and figure out how to fix it. And no matter what it is, if it's in regards to business, something in business, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I can see this problem and I can say, okay, I can look at it critically and say, I wanna solve this problem. But if I'm just 
uh, like in the internship I went to in Milwaukee, I hated it. You know why? They had me doing like brainless stuff. Mm -hmm. Like where it's like, like calling to check on these packages of whether they made it or not to this location. And why was this box damaged? And like that to me, that's not, that's not exciting. Like that's just like find some, Nobody else to do this. Right. I don't want to do this. This is not me. Mm -hmm. So it was like, really, it was like, it's not, it, it wasn't captivating for me. Yeah. Like, so um, I just couldn't, I just, I just, I didn't like it. I didn't like that internship. Um, of course, I didn't take the job in Milwaukee, you know, mm -hmm. to, to go there after I graduated. When but, it comes to that, oh, I hate to interrupt you. No, yeah. I think about this being, you said you didn't like it. From mm -hmm. the external perspective, did they did they see you as like, oh, he's not good? What was the external perception of like you in that job? Or did you realize I don't like this menial task type of work? No, so the way so what happened so the funny thing that happened in Milwaukee was it's not a lot of black people in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of black people. Right? <laughs> the guy who the VP that re that requested me was a black guy. So I was looked at as the t the guy that the black guy bought in. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So that's how they was looking at me like, oh, you just here because this guy wanted mm -hmm. you here. Mm -hmm. He's the boss. Mm -hmm. So I got to like it. That's how I was kind of treated. And so I, but me, in my mind, I'm like, well, I don't know what y'all talking about. I'm it. Like, I'm the one. Right. Like, so I'm here for a reason. But, um, but it, 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 and I, of course, there the the, uh, the few black people that were at the company we would all talk and like there was one guy that was a uh um he had been at the company for a couple of years he was like head of like uh recruiting or something like that college recruiting or something like that right black guy younger black guy he's younger than me but he invites all of the black people at this job to go to his house one day he's having like a cookout right and he was like um he was he was talking and he was like, yeah, you know, such and such. And we got to we got to be better and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And we, somehow we got into the conversation of me being brought in to be the in, to be an intern. And he was like, yeah, he's like, we can't do that anymore. And I was like, what do you mean? Can't do what anymore? And he was like, well, the way it was done, you know, the guy, um, the guy, I don't want to say this, the guy's name, the VP's name. Mm -hmm. But he was like, you know, he just he just kind of crapped on protocol. Mm -hmm. and bought you here mm -hmm. and he was like and it looks bad for us as black people that he would do that mm -hmm. and I said no what looks bad is the fact that you're not supporting him because they do this all the time man so if they got a VP Johnny so-and-so and they want to bring my nephew Clyde the Clyde Johnson my buddy's Golfing Son, partner, we're golfing partner. Mm -hmm. They're gonna they're gonna find a way yeah. to get little 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 Johnny in here. Yeah. So why is it so bad when we do it? But see, he's been in that. He's been living in Milwaukee and he, us all white people, and so he's always had to feel like he has to be a different way. And I always struggle with the fact that black people feel the need to be take the high route. Mm. Hate taking the high route. Mm -hmm. Why can't I just be the man? Like I'm, like I'm the man. Yeah. Like I'm, 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 just, I'm just saying, like any, any one of us, that something that we can do, we're so dynamic and we're so, we can bring so much value to a company. Mm -hmm. Why do we always have to be the ones to take the high road? Yeah. Or try to do everything to per protocol. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because if I become VP, you know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, my people coming. They're going to be like, they're going to one by one. They're going to be cut here. Right. There goes another one. Because we're going to turn this thing out. Yeah. Like, we're not about to be, I don't, I don't disseminate. Like, I don't uh, assimilate. Mm -hmm. That's the word. I don't yeah, assimilate yeah. Mm. To, to that. And which brings me to the whole reason why I'm not in corporate anymore. Because I felt like every single day, I have to put on a different face. That's not my own and be a different person because my true self who I really am and how I really talk and how I really interact with people they they couldn't handle that mm -hmm. like I, I have to be a different person mm. and it's not bad like who I am is not like I'm not you know cussing and you know what I'm saying just doing crazy stuff but it's like 
You don't have to turn on that. Oh, hi, Bob. That, like, I cannot imagine you. I could not imagine you. <laughs> I'm great at it. You are? Great at it. I swear. But that it, that but takes it, a lot of energy. It's taxing. Yeah. It's taxing to me because it's like, I have to constantly be like in my mind telling myself like, All right, eh, don't say what you really want to say right now, B. But I be want to say some stuff. Mm-hmm. But then it's like, you know, I can, I'll get real technical with you. Oh, you, you should. I'll send you an email right now, Janet. Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. But it's like, it, it was taxing and it was like, and I, I, I told you, I saw the lady who had been there for 35, 40 years and retired. She was a black lady. And I'm just like, I can't do this. Yeah. Can't do this. And um, I was just like, and I kind of, my, my job kind of gave me um, coronavirus kind of gave me the the out to actually be an entrepreneur mm-hmm. um, because it was I was working at I was work, working at this company that I was working at that I was just working at I don't even want to say their name again okay but you know what it is yes. right so um, and I was bought in as a level one employee with experience 10 years military experience right mm-hmm. I'm bringing with me so the timetable was, it was supposed to be like a year later, I was supposed to be, or maybe a year, I think a year later, I was supposed to be automatically promoted. I was not promoted, right? So what happened is, so after I wasn't promoted, I uh, to went to my manager like, hey, you know, I was hired as, you know, level one with experience. Um, you know, I'm supposed to be promoted, you know, blah, 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 blah. She's like, oh yeah, you're right. Let me double check on that, blah, 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 blah. And she's like, she comes back to me. She's like, well, we have to interview you for the le- for the for the level bump, and mm-hmm. I'm like, it's supposed to be automatic. It's supposed to be automatic, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm like, all right, whatever. So they had there was this white girl that they had, they had bought in, ditzy white girl, no experience, no ten years military experience, no just just out of college, you know what I'm saying? It's this ditzy cornbread white girl, right? And so I'm thinking I'm going for this interview is just a formality. This is what my manager's telling me. Mm-hmm. This is a formality. Mm-hmm. You just got to, we have to go through the process. But they interview her too. Mind you, she had got there maybe like six months after me, six months to a year after me, mm-hmm. right? So I had already been there doing, managing high level accounts. Like I'm going to Phoenix, Arizona and like traveling to see my clients. And like, I'm doing, like I'm everywhere. Like I'm doing, um, uh, Ten million dollar contracts. I'm like, I'm killing it, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm managing all these clients and this and that. And then, and I'm like, yo, what's up with my, you know, some my my raise or my my promotion? We're gonna interview. So they interview me. They interview the girl. So a while goes by. A couple months go by, and I'm like, asking my manager, like, what's the status on the blah 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 blah. She calls me into her room. Um, well, we're gonna promote um, such and such, the other person, this white girl. I'm like, why? Um, well, um, she was able to, uh, they gave some, some crazy excuse, right? Some crazy excuse about something, right? So I was like, okay. Let it go for a little while. I thought about it, thought about it. So I'm a, I'm a, I was like, I, don't, I, I wasn't feeling right. So I was like, I've, I've been doing too much and I've been working too hard for me to not um, have gotten this promotion that was supposed to be automatic anyway. Yeah, yeah. Right? I go to HR. Right? I'm telling them, like, look, I've been here since, this time I might, might have been there like three years. Okay. Two, or, two or three years, something like that. Okay. Yeah. It's supposed time, to be automatic after a year. It's supposed to be automatic after a year. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> mind you, so then we had the interview that took a couple months. Mm-hmm. Then I'm waiting, that took a couple months. And, and you know, so at this time, it might have been there like three years at this time, right? Got it. So I'm like, you know, H, I'm telling HR, I'm like, look, so there, so HR is asking me, well, have you been getting performance reviews every year? Yeah, every year, my performance, I'm at the top. Mm-hmm. Like, look, you see, all, you got all my performance evaluations, never late, never nothing, just everything is great, right? So, so HR looks at everything and HR goes and says, you're right. You, had, you were supposed to have been promoted two years ago. Mm-hmm. Guess what they did? Promoted me twice. Okay. Right? So they gave me like a two-point bump. Interesting. Right. 
I found out. So now I find out that the person that didn't want me to get the raise was my senior manager who mm. didn't like me. White dude, Mormon dude. Mm -hmm. We never got along. I never, this dude was just weird to me, right? So mm -hmm. I kind of, kind of avoided him as much as I could. Mm -hmm. And so my manager, while she's telling me she wants to promote me, he's telling her, no, got I want to promote this person. Mm -hmm. Right. And now find out that they're going to lunch together and they hang out and the wife knows her and this and that. They're at his, her, the, the new girl got married. They're at her wedding and all this. I'm like, okay, okay. I see what, so then I, that's when I went to HR. I'm like, okay, now nah, something going on. And so when I went to HR, now this senior manager really is on my, on my head. Got it. So then boom, COVID happens and we're all working from home. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're working from home. And, um, you know, my calls are on. I got my work phone. I got my laptop with all my calls on my emails, right? So I randomly get a call one day. Oh, hey, this is uh, so-and-so. Um, we've got a report that you've been mischarging your time. Right. You got, we've got a report that you've all right, been... here we go. Here we go. Mm -hmm. I'm like, mischarging my time? What do you mean? Oh, mm -hmm. well, what time do you log on? I was like, no, I normally log on about like 7, between 7 and 7. Because... The way it works at the company is we work for we work uh, Monday through Thursday, 10 hour days. Right. So that's how we get our 40, 40, 40 hours a weekend. OK, gotcha. Because I was salary. I, was, okay. I wasn't an hourly, hour, hourly worker. So you just have to build the hours, but you're going to get the same pay every week. Correct. I mean, anyway. Yeah. You mm -hmm. have to because it's a government contract job. Mm -hmm. You have to build the hours to the, the to the um to the contract that you're working for got it right so mm -hmm. if we're working a contract for these planes or whatever the case may be then i have to build toward those planes if we're work if i'm working on another plane or another part or something i have to build it to that got it so but my my price stays the same but like so she's she's like yeah what time do you log on i'm like you know i log on from you know around 7 30 she's like what time do you log off i said well i finished my 10 hours you know what I'm saying? Like, so I might, you know, do something, answer some emails, and then I don't have no emails to, to work on. And I might go do something else and come back and we've got some more emails. Okay, I'll answer them, get on my phone calls, whatever the case may be. Is that normal? Like, do you think job? that? So I'm like, do you think that I'm going to sit here on the laptop with my hand on the mouse and one on the computer and I'm just moving the mouse back and forth for 10 straight hours? Are they looking at your. They're looking at keystrokes. Are you serious? Yes. And I'm like, this is impossible. Like, this is impossible. Mm -hmm. I was like, you see every day. And she was like, yeah, it says I see you log in every morning around this time. Mm -hmm. She's like, sometimes you don't log off till 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. So what? I got clients that are in Berlin and, mm -hmm. and not Berlin. Um, um, I have Norway. I had a client in Norway and I got clients in a different time zone. Like, so I may, they're still up yeah. or they're, they're just not getting up. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm like, what's wrong with that? As long as I'm getting my 10 hours in. And I'm some some days I would work 11, 12 hours, you know what I'm saying? And then the next day I would work eight hours or something yeah. like that. But you can do that, that per, mm -hmm. per your manager. You can do that. Mm -hmm. So I was like, this is nonsense. Right. So that's what they said. They said I was mischarging my time and they let me go. It was just like that. They, they called me. Well, they did like an investigation. That's they, crazy. They called me back. They were like. We see that, you know, there are times during the day where you're mm -hmm. not on the computer. And I said, well, I have a work phone, mm -hmm. which is attached to my, um, you know, we had a Skype where you could text or e email somebody at any, at any time. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm, I have it on me at all times. Mm -hmm. As I asked my manager, do I miss calls? Do I miss meetings? Do I miss anything? No, she, she says you always. The best way to support the Work and Play podcast is by subscribing to the YouTube channel and by going to your favorite podcast player to subscribe and rate the Work and Play podcast. That's all you have to do. So if you are liking the Work and Play podcast, the content, the stories that we're sharing, and you know that this will help someone, go ahead and share the content to someone who could actually use it and help them on their journey to transition from corporate into entrepreneurship. Now let's get back into the episode. So, so what are you basing this off of? Yeah, and, and you and you can't even fight it because you you at home and you, there's no even no HR desk that you right. can go to anymore. Right, I can't even go to, to somebody's face. I'm talking to somebody on the phone I ain't never seen before. It's hard to fight that case like that. And I'm like, so I even went to like a, um, like an employment um, lawyer because I was like, this is crazy. I was like, I know that this dude is targeting me because mm. I because when I got my promotion, not only did they promote me once, they promote promoted me twice. Like my raise was like twenty two percent. 
Ah, that 22% raise. Yeah. Normally when you get a raise, it's like 8%, right. 9%, mm -hmm. 10% if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. I got a 22% raise. He was not happy. He was like, oh no. Yeah, yeah. But see, that that just goes back to like what I say like about the why we always feel like we got to take the high road. These jokers ain't taking the high road. Mm -mm. They're not taking no road. No. They're taking whatever road they want. Whatever road. And, and that's the thing. Yeah, you're right. I, I think um, I think listening to your story, and it's like, have you ever felt in that in that process did you ever because you you've been the man right mm -hmm. you know you say i'm that guy right mm -hmm. but did you ever feel hopeless or like did you ever get no. down on yourself because you couldn't control it mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm. because growing up i've been through much worse like i like i told you i was i was in foster homes group homes and detention centers growing up and i seen a lot of struggle and pain early on mm -hmm. And I think that that kept me grounded to understand that no matter how bad it does get, yeah. I, could always, I could always get out of it. Because if you have a mindset that is not gonna let you fail, I, I won't give up. Yeah. Like I won't give up. Like mm -hmm. if it gets bad, I'm just gonna be like, all right, B, you just gotta like tighten up. We're gonna do something else. Yeah. Like either way, something, I'm gonna make it work. It's yeah. gonna work. Yeah, no I love that mindset. Yeah. And I can hear it because a lot of the things that you experienced, while you describe it, the way you describe it is like, this is what happened to me. People are like, people could be against you. People could mm -hmm. be hating on you, whatever. It can have such a mental toll, but the way you experience mm -hmm. it is like, this is just what it is. This and so that's, is. that's the, the mental toughness that I can hear. Yeah. So now, like you mentioned government contracting, mm -hmm. but just to kind of clarify, and, and because I know your story a little bit, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm probably didn't ask a lot of questions about the subcontracting part of it mm -hmm. but like as a subcontractor mm -hmm. how did that experience help you kind of navigate into this space of government contracting it taught me everything that i needed to know about how to speak to a contractor right mm -hmm. so and meeting meeting jason and having lunch with him that one day he'll tell you because he was like <laughs> He said, uh, I think I went to his, he did like a, an intimate class at Rick Ross's house a couple months ago and I went, right? Mm -hmm. And when I got in there, he was like, what's up, B? He was like, man, he's like, B met me. I thought he knew everything. And he was like, he, he's like, I do this and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> he kind of he put me on the spot. Yeah. But great, you know, my, that's my dude. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he was like, you know, when, 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 we, when we sitting there at, a, we was at Cheesecake Factory, me, him, and Dave. And I'm eating, like, because a lot of times I'm, I, I'm always around Dave, right? And Dave be around all kind of different people. Mm -hmm. And I, for some reason, like, I hear, like, a lot of times I hear what people are talking about. A lot of people just talk about crazy stuff, yeah. right? Like, the amount of people that he be around and the amount of things and information that are thrown around, if you're not, if you can't filter it, it's almost like an overload of information. Right. Like, because it's so many people that do so many different things, and it's like, Overlook. What do I do with all this information? Exactly. Right. So, so a lot of times I just like I'm in my own little world. Mm. Like I'm so I'm eating my food or whatever, and this and Jason's talking, and I'm like, Hey, I know what he's talking about. Yeah, he's talking about <laughs> contract. And I'm, I'm still eating this stuff, right? And Dave is asking him questions and stuff, and I'm like, I'm eating. And at some point in time, he's telling me just he got all these contracts, thirty something contracts, and blah blah blah. I'm like, All right, man. I was like, Yo, I do this for a living. I was like, so you telling me that you got, this, you know, these contracts and this, and you've done X, Y, he's like, yeah. And he's telling me play by play how he does it. And I'm just like, wow. Yeah. And from that was this, that was, I'm like, at that point in time, I'm like, cause I wasn't an entrepreneur. I was still at Lockheed. Mm -hmm. Damn, I was at the company. I know. But I was still at the company, right? And so at that time I was still, I had my safety net. I'm making my cushy paycheck and all that. I'm good, right? So I'm like, I kept it in the back of my mind, like, man, if I ever be an, if I'm ever an entrepreneur, this is where I'm going Run because this is right on my, this is right on, right down my alley. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what I'm saying, like, Turo was, was is is like a, you know, they get you some money and kind of, but it's not a, it's not really a, um, it's not as sustainable as something like government contracting is Got because, it. like, even even now, like Turo, I'm experiencing um, some some a level of um, I feel like the market is like oversaturated. Got now. it. Okay. So there's so, when I first started Turo, I was getting booked 
every day, every weekend, all the time. Now I feel because I feel like there wasn't a lot of cars to choose from then. Yes. As many as there are now. Mm -hmm. But now everybody's got a course on put put your cars on Turo and how to make money with your rental car business and blah blah blah. blah. You got all these options now, and it's like people ain't even people haven't booked my cars in a long time. Yeah, but you the know? government. But the government, it's always there's ninety thousand contracts that come out like per week or yeah. every couple of days or something like that. Mm -hmm. Thousands and thousands of contracts. Yeah, they're always gonna, it's they're always gonna need these contracts. Filled, yeah, and there's no way they could get them all filled. I gotta ask you this because mm -hmm. like I had Jason on the podcast and mm -hmm. I feel like at every single point I had a question that I thought was a good question. It was uh -huh. like that don't make no sense. So why would you think that way? Right. right. And because you had the subcontracting experience, when you mm. jumped into the like government contracting space, mm. what were some of the things that you had to unlearn in order to do well at what you do? Just how, mm. um, how to be more relaxed and not so technical about everything, mm. right? So like from where I was, it was like everything is by the book, government contracts, FAR clauses, and DFAR, DFAS, and all, every, everything was a clause, and it has to be done this way, it has to be documented this way, and you have to build this purchase order this way, and you have to put this, everything, it was like, it took me so long, like, that was, it was like the kind of brainless stuff that I hated to do. Got it. Like, in order to build a contract, I had to have all this language in it, and it had to have this legal jargon, and it had to have this clause, and these, it was, that was the part about it I hated. Yeah. The part I liked about my job was going to clients, fixing problems, mm -hmm. right? Why is your production taking so long? Why haven't you sent me my parts? What's going on? Like. And now I'm going to the manufacturing plant. I'm looking like at the assembly line, like, all right, well, you, okay, yeah, this needs, y'all could probably do better with yeah, this yeah. right here. Or why y'all put it in this packaging? Because if you put it in a different packaging, it'll be more insulated or whatever, you know, just stuff like that. Which is and technically not your job, but that's the fun part. But it is part of my job because okay. it's my job to manage my clients. Got you. So any client that, any issue that happens with my clients that I've been assigned to, they're gonna to come to me. Yeah, That's yeah. a metric that 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 reflects on me. Gotcha. So if my packages are coming in late every all the time, Brandon, why is your stuff coming in late? Oh, I don't know. I gotta find out. Well, let me go out here to Phoenix, Arizona, or let me go out here to uh, Nogales, Mexico, or let me go out here to Norway. Norway and see. <laughs> I didn't get to go to Norway okay. though. But let me go to all these places to see what's going on. Um, and it could be a production, it could be a shortage of material, it mm -hmm. could be, and you find out, like they'll tell you like, oh, we can't send you this this week because we didn't get the the aluminum from the aluminum plant, or we didn't get the, you know what I'm saying, it's, it, we had a setback in getting our parts from, so a lot of times the, you're getting a part from, from, a, from a company and they're getting multiple different parts from multiple different companies, right? Okay. So they're getting part from here, part from here, and they put it all together, but if they don't have this one part to complete it, they can't send it to you. Okay. And then what we're making is going on a government aircraft. It has to be safe. It has to be approved. It can't, it can't send you no defective part. It has mm -hmm. to be tested and weather tested and all that because at the end of the day, there's a military lives that are going to be on this. And that was, it was near and dear to me because right. I was in the military. So I'm like, well, you know, this it was, it's serious. Wow. So like you got to make sure that, you know, you're giving them these parts and they're good to go wow so yeah um what was the question the question was um oh you, did i have to unlearn anything right you having to unlearn just to be more loose just to be more like, loose and be, not so technical not so technical because now it's like you can you can submit for a contract and you can call that contract person and i realized this contract person is a me yeah right <laughs> so i'm talking to who i would have been uh -huh. and so if i if i got somebody and it's not supposed to be like this mm. right you're not supposed to like build a relationship or have a relationship with somebody who's trying to get a contract from you oh you're not supposed to do that I didn't know it's against that. the rules okay you're supposed to have a fair competitive bid so that if you if Ariel wants to put in a bid and Brandon puts in a bid and XYZ put in a bid it's even across the board mm -hmm. I'm, I'm unbiased right but because you have that insider knowledge you don't even have to develop a relationship if you don't you don't have to but if I just call you and say how's your day I'm calling because I want to submit this proposal to you blah 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 blah, blah. Um, and I can talk to people 
So, you know, I can get them to laugh and I can get, you know, you got any kids? You know what I'm saying? We talk about, oh, yeah, are you, are you, a, are you a Cowboys fan or whatever? I'm not a Cowboys fan, but just anything. Mm-hmm. I'll say anything on the phone. Mm-hmm. Now, when you got XYZ's bid comes in and Ariel's bid comes in and Brandon's bid come in and they're all pretty much the same, who are you going to pick? Yeah, Brandon. The person who you who you talk to, That's right. even a little bit of a relationship. Yeah. He's a Cowboys fan. Or, yeah. I don't know, Brandon's got kids and this and that. We talked about, you just subconsciously, you're not even doing it on purpose. It's like subconsciously, you're like, uh, let's, let's take this guy. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Let's mm-hmm. do him. So, and that, com- but if I was, when I was, and I actually did it in one of the bids that I put out, a $5 million bid that I put out, and I went to these different companies, I went and did a, um, like an audit on their company and what they could provide for us. And I ended up picking this one company out in Dalton, Dalton, Georgia, which is like an hour uh, above Marietta. Mm-hmm. And um, it was because when I went there, you know, we talked and I just, we had been talking. They had, they had more questions than all the other companies, right? So it could have it looked like they don't know what they're doing, mm-hmm. right? But when they're calling and asking these questions, we're talking. And I'm like, yeah, you know, such and such, such and such. And yeah, we're laughing. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, did you, you catch that game last night? Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. And boy, that rain was terrible last night. And it was, but so when it came down to it, to make a call on the who to give the contract to, for me, it was a no-brainer. I'm like, we got to pick them. Yeah. Subconsciously. So now you're in that seat. I'm in that seat. You are, um, how long have you been a full-time entrepreneur now? Um, since... December of not last year, the year before that. So okay, December of twenty twenty one two twenty 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 mm-hmm. December twenty twenty. And so you've been doing Turo and government contracting, right? I haven't got any. Gov- I haven't got a government contract yet. Gotcha. So I'm still working. I'm still submitting. Um, but I, I'm, I'm. I will say I haven't been submitting as much bids as I probably should be. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, that that's on me. Gotcha. Like I, I know it's 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 coming, and I know that it's gonna it's gonna pick up real soon. I just have to invest more time and effort energy. and energy mm-hmm. into it versus you know worrying about Turo or worrying about um, you know because I'm still coaching, you know. So I, I do that kind of stuff, but yes, yes. I have to put myself on more of a regimented schedule to say okay from these hours a day i'm going to be submitting government contract bids and i know that eventually it's gonna, it's 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 inevitable like yeah. it's just it's just too um lucrative or not, not lucrative it's just too it falls in line with what i do yeah like it's just it's there for me it's just like right there and another thing it's a low-hanging it. fruit for me it, it really is, but I think it also once you get into a groove of it all. Oh yeah. It because of the way I understand government contracting, you can yeah. get your hands in all these different things, mm. and because your mind is more so the breadth of information instead mm. of like getting stuck in one thing. Yeah. You get a chance to like exercise your brain in all these different industries. Yeah. And then the other part of you, which is really really dying to live, is mm. this like problem solving side of you, mm. and you have this business intel that like. What I what I love about the government contracting space, and I just said this, so it's like fresh in my mind, but it's a vehicle to yeah. like get a process, right? Mm-hmm. To start generating money, but yeah. then you can focus your time and energy on whatever what I, the what purpose I really is. Want to do, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's yeah. so easy for you because literally kind of everything builds on itself. Yeah. Like from your 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 uh your military experience and then becoming a chef, which Turns out to be like the best inventory training that, that really? you ever needed. Yeah. Coming coming full circle to, into like a supply chain, into the business area, and now you're you're taking con- you're contracting for military people who are t- essentially using some of the mm-hmm. the um, materials and stuff that you would have used as a as, as a per, uh, as a service member. The, yes, I want to say soldier, but it was not petty officer. It was um, a name. A na- a na- well, they call them seamen. Semen. And I don't like to say semen. <laughs> for obvious no. reasons. What do you guys say? Pause. For, yeah, right. for obvious reasons. I don't so, like to say semen. Yeah, but, but to to be able to like sit somewhere, bring in the money on a regular basis, mm. let that be your vehicle to do right. what you truly want your brain to work at. Right. I think it'll be a win win. Yeah. 
I, and I and I love it. I love the like the I love the fact that I can wake up in the morning. I can go on my laptop, look at these like look at these contracts, and just be like, oh, that one, that one, you know, wh whichever one I want, mm -hmm. I can do. Mm -hmm. Like I can say, I want to try that. I want to try that. I want to try that. And it's like there's no there's no parameters around that besides me just doing it. And I had a bid that I really thought that I was gonna win a couple, like maybe two weeks ago. It was for portable toilets in Utah somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I just knew I just knew I was gonna win this bid. It was like $875,000 for like five years. And I ended up not getting it. I just found out like maybe like a week or two ago. Mm -hmm. But um, I just like, I was ready to like pop a champagne bottle and like, I was ready to go like, I, I just knew I had this bid, but I didn't get it. Um, so I, I feel like it kind of that kind of like um, gave me, you? Def oh. it, def it, mm -hmm. it deflated me a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't stay deflated for too long about anything. Yeah. So it's like I just know I gotta go harder now. Yeah. You know. So I had I, I had that one in. I didn't get it. It's like now, okay. Let me let me submit twenty now. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. Like like I I, I can't like because I at the time I had only submitted maybe like. That one, it was like two or three other ones. Mm -hmm. So it's like now I gotta like if it's, it's now to me it's like a numbers a numbers thing. Like if I if I um you know as many as I put out, the more the more bids I put out, the more possibility of me of getting it. So yeah, that's just where I'm at with it now. I got you. Can we dream a bit? Because sure. I feel like the problem solving side of you is pretty cool. But like, and, and also like seeing you go to your clients and be like, okay, well, if we wrap this package up, like if we if we optimize this casing or if we mm. do this process this way, if you were to think about like the ideal type of problems that you like working on, because you, you get a chance to hang out with Dave, shout out to Dave Shans, mm. and you get to see a lot of the problems that a lot of entrepreneurs deal with all the time. Mm. Which ones like, like get, get, get your juices flowing the most? Or have you seen the problem that you like working on the most? Um... I don't know. I don't know. Um, because, I, like I said, I try to stay. Like Dave did a podcast the other day, or it might have aired, aired the other day, and he was talking about can you be too can can friendship? It was something about like can I be too close to? Like, am I too like me personally? Mm -hmm. Am I too close to be able to do? Because I have the I have the privilege right of being able to be around all of these people that David's around mm -hmm. without having to like buy a course or you know like I, I get the information right so we, yeah. we're I'm getting this information and we're sitting down eating mm -hmm. I'm at David's house and he's got them at his house and it's like they're telling him all this stuff that they do and I'm seeing all these people like that Dave's around and the amount of money that's being thrown and I'm like dang like I should be I mean like that mm -hmm. And so I think my, I think that the biggest problem that I would say is the fact of me being able to live, I won't say live up to the expectation, but like be on that level. Mm. Like for me, that's my goal is to like to be on the level to where it's not like, I'm just here because I'm Dave's friend. Yeah. I'm here because look, this is what B does. Like B does, so, so he he's killing it in government contractor right now. Or he's I was killing that tour for a while, but I tell you, like it slowed down. Mm -hmm. But um, like to be in a car because I'll go, we'll go somewhere like to a conference or whatever, and I, you know, Dave's my friend for like 21 years, best friend, right? So like we go, and it's funny because now it's like we go, people want to take his picture, picture with him. And you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. get his autograph and like, oh my God, I watch mm -hmm. your podcast every day. So it's easy to look at your peers mm -hmm. and the um, exposure that they get right. and then desire to be on that level um, in life. But then in terms of the problems that you solve, it seems like you're thinking of the problems that they solve and mm -hmm. wanting to solve some of the problems that they solve so well well it's not even it's so it's not even a like a specific problem right it's a mentality mm. of being able to solve a problem yeah yeah like you just like like the way that they look at things 
is different than just the average person look at thing. And you know they say, if you're the if you're the if you are the wealthiest person in the room, mm -hmm. they need to get into another room. Mm -hmm. So it's like I've been able to be as David's grown, mm -hmm. like be in different rooms. I remember we was in Tampa one time. He did a podcast with Myron Golden, mm -hmm. and Myron was driving us. We got in the car with Myron. We were going from one location to another. I was in the back seat. Him and Dave were talking. And Byron, uh, Myron was just talking and talking. I was just like, where am I right now? Like, this is like next, like it, just the way that he thinks and articulates his thought or his process mm -hmm. is like, to me, like if you were a regular person and you just like, you never thought about nothing like this, it's mm -hmm. like so, it's so out of this world kind of like yeah. this. And I was just like, what car am I in right now? Like that I'm just in the back, I'm talking to this guy who's just saying these things and like, it makes so much sense, but you have to put your mind on a track to be able to process it. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, it's not it's not necessarily about a specific problem that I see that somebody has solved or needs to be solved. It's just the, it's just the matter of having a mindset to, it's to see whatever problem there, whatever problem may arise yeah. and how you deal with that. Like you can deal with, like, it's, it's like, when you're a parent, right, and you have a child and they do something wrong, right, there's a bunch of different ways you can react to it. Like, I can spank my child. I can punish them or ground mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. I can um, take something away from them, which is like a form of punishment as well, right? I can talk to them or I can yell and scream and whatever the case may be, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, what's the, what's the, what's the, the, in a black household, what's the most acceptable thing to do? You're gonna get your butt whooped, right? Yeah. You're gonna get your butt whooped, you're gonna get yelled at, probably get uh, punished too. Probably get all three of them, mm -hmm. right? Now, if I had a different mindset, I, and I, I relate this back to kids, because you asked the question, how I relate my budding entrepreneurship to being a father, right? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back to this. There was one time that my son, my oldest son, um, he was doing something that he, wouldn't, he wasn't supposed to be doing, and I spanked him, right? And I was spanking him with a belt. And I remember spanking him and him looking into my eyes and he was just like, it was, his eyes were full of fear. And I remember from that point, I was like, why am I doing this? Like, I want him to fear me, but I don't want him to be fearful of me. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want him to do what's right, but I don't want him to fear me. Like, I don't want him to feel like you want He's to scared of me. You. Yeah, yeah, I don't want him to be scared of me, mm -hmm. right? And I remember I was like, this is this spanking stuff is probably not the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. So like my two younger, my two younger, my youngest kids, like I'll pop them, but I've never like Spank taken them. a belt to them and like, you know, like I did my oldest son, and yeah. because it's a mindset that changed for me. Yeah, that's a totally different mindset. Like I can get more out of them. Or I can get them to do more of, of what I want them to do by being an example, by talking to them more, by showing them, you know, right from wrong, like giving them examples. Like it's there's different ways than just you're going to get that butt toe up. Go get the, go get the switch from outside. That's old school. Right. Yeah. So the new the, the new with with entrepreneurship is the same because the old school entrepreneur is like, OK. I'm gonna go buy some t-shirts, I'm gonna put something on a t-shirt, I'm gonna sell them, mm -hmm. I'm gonna keep doing that. Yeah. But you get caught in that cycle for years, mm -hmm. right? And it could it could take off and you have your budding, you know, great t-shirt brand or whatever the case may be, but even my mindset is even even evolved past that. Because I've saw I've seen that. Like we sleepers for suckers, me and Dave started that together. Yeah, you see. And like I from the beginning, like mm. the first set of t-shirts that David ever bought. I paid for half, he paid for half. Wow. I sent him money from the military, like, here, bro, like, wow. and, and he was selling them here out of the car and all that, but, and that evolved and evolved and evolved. And I've seen, but his mindset has changed from just that to, you know, a higher level of entrepreneurship. And I think that that is the key to understanding how to maintain success and how to create success mm. in entrepreneurship mm -hmm. it's the mindset that it's your mindset that has to change and like because it's like when you hear these people talk about they go to these 
um, mastermind classes, they pay fifty thousand dollars. It's mm -hmm. like the rent to the normal person's like fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> talking about like what? Fifty thousand dollars to yeah. go to hear this man talk? Yo, I felt like what I heard Byron say in the car for thirty minutes was worth that. That's crazy, right? That's a whole mindset change because military B would have been like, man, yeah, $50,000, bro. I feel you. You're talking one crazy. of the things that I really want to point out, though, and it's really not a question, it's just that I didn't even realize you had such an influence in, in Sleepers for Suckers, mm. which also ties in like supply chain, which also ties in inventory, yeah. which yeah. also. And then I think about like how you as a uh, subcontractor, right? Mm -hmm. No, 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 right? Is a subcontractor, would you say so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah would so. go into a business, mm -hmm. identify a problem, mm -hmm. and solve it. These mm -hmm. are multi-million dollar businesses or Correct. small businesses, right? Correct. No, yeah, they're not. No, my clients when I was at were not small They're multi-million dollar businesses. Yes, these okay. are Fortune 500 companies. Yes, I want to make sure I get yes. the scale right because yes. a lot of times my peers, and mm -hmm. I, I would consider you and my peer because like, I have a lot of corporate friends who like do amazing things, mm -hmm. million dollar, multi-million dollar contracts, solve mm -hmm. multi-million dollar problems. Mm -hmm. And when we get out here into entrepreneurship, the vantage point that we have mm -hmm. is so individualistic mm -hmm. that we forget about the scale of business that we're familiar with. Right. So the what I this is a this is an opinion or a perspective as opposed to a question, but the vantage point that I see you having is these are multi-million dollar businesses sitting around a table and they mm -hmm. all have problems. Right. And as easy as it is for you to like go to a multi-million dollar business and say, hey, why don't you just tweak that package mm -hmm. and make this thing, that'll save you a couple million or that'll mm -hmm. get us on time. I feel like that's the, you have, you have the vulnerability at the palm of your hands of people mm -hmm. talking about their problems all the time. Right. And you being able to not necessarily get into Turo because that's what a lot of people are doing right now, but mm -hmm. to you have a vantage point into the problems that need to be solved at a level that other people don't have exposure to. Mm -hmm. So it's, when you talk about mindset shift, it's like a I offer this external perspective of being like when you're at a table, just in your listening instead of listening for the information because Dave is what Dave can get from Myron Myron Golden mm -hmm. is different from what you can that's get from true. Myron Golden. That's true. What you can get from Myron Golden might be like mm -hmm. his pain points or whatever it is that you could do to solve his problem. Mm -hmm. Dave is mentee. You're yeah. not necessarily mentee in that in that car. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to offer that perspective yeah. shift. It's like a bird it's a bird's eye view. Yeah. It's a bird's eye view. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think it's taken me a little bit longer um, on my journey just mm -hmm. because of the differences of what I've, you know, what I, the transitions I've went through. Mm -hmm. But I think those transitions are necessary because I'm the type of person um, who I have to I have to be hands on with it. Mm -hmm. Like like I was the I was the kid. Who you remember? You know, remember the old story like your mama tell you don't touch the hot stove, mm -hmm, and the dad will be like, let him touch it. Yeah, I had to touch the stove. Yeah, yeah. Like, cause you telling me it's hot, I don't believe you. <laughs> I will. Uh huh. Oh, that thing hot. Yeah. I gotta touch it. Mm -hmm. So I'm more, I'm more hands on. So like, I learn from experiences, and I learn from even, even from failures, even from doing, even from something not happening how I expected it to turn out. But like like we said earlier, like I never let things get me down for long. Like I'm even like just even relationships or I don't hold grudge. Like it's like I, 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 I'm a, I'll be upset for a little while, and it's like after that, I'm, I'm, you, you good? You good? We good? Like I'll start messing with you now. Like I'm over it. Like it's it's just like let's go to the next. And as a kid, as a kid, I read a lot of books. And even as an adult, I read in the military. I read a lot of books. Had a lot of time being on, yeah. on the boat. So I went. I, re yeah. I read books like um, one of one of my favorite books was How to Win Friends and Influence mm. People, right? Mm -hmm. And it talks about like everybody, no matter what they do, has a reason that's valid in their mind of why they did it. Nobody just ain't out here just <laughs> why you do this. Uh -huh. <laughs> They got a reason. Right. You could be a, in the book. It talks about somebody who was murdering somebody. They mm -hmm. left a note. It was like 
this is why I've murdered all these people. <laughs> and it's crazy to you to hear somebody murder somebody, but in their mind, they're, they Innocent have, it's artist. validated. Mm -hmm. It's validated. Yes, yes. And so understanding that people do things for a reason, mm -hmm. and that helps me, that helps me also solve problems. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because if you can deal with people, you can solve a problem. Yep. Right? Because if you're the type of person that I can't talk to you or you're so closed and hey, Ariel, what's wrong? And you don't say nothing. I can't solve you. I can't help you mm -hmm. unless you tell me what's going on. But like for me, it's like, B, what's going on? Let me think about it for a second. I'm going to get back to you. All right. So this is how I feel. Like, you know, I really feel like we need to be doing this because when, when this when we do this, this happens. And let's really figure out how not to do that. And like, it's just being able to be a person that can articulate the problem or a problem or being a person that can be um, personable, like just talking to somebody. Sometimes just talking to somebody helps the problem. Yeah. Right. Sometimes just talking about it makes it better because mm -hmm. we could sit here and talk about it. You talk, I talk, you talk, I talk. And then it's like, OK. I feel better. Or you said something that I never really thought about. Mm -hmm. Then that makes sense. Let's let's try that. Yep. It's almost like brainstorming. I love brainstorming. So yeah. Honestly and truly, I feel like this conversation is a brainstorm <laughs> because like we were talking about a podcast idea earlier, and I'm like, because you have this like wealth of knowledge in different areas. Mm -hmm. You know, you being able to solve different problems and just talk to different approaches mm -hmm. to like solve a problem. Like you could probably talk all day about a problem in the in the culinary industry, in the supply chain industry, in yeah. the corporate industry, in the military industry. Like, and it sounds like that's where your passion lies. Mm -hmm. It just sounds like the process to getting there. You're in it. Yeah, you're so in the process of getting there. Yeah, yeah. Windy. Mm hmm. Yeah. But yeah, but I would enjoy I would enjoy like hearing like you go off for an hour <laughs> just talking about the culinary side of things. But we yeah. only have an hour, and 30 minutes to talk about it. And I feel like we just grazed the surface. Yeah. But what I will say is um, I've appreciated talking about like, for me. I see so many different connections mm -hmm. um, and one motif of it all definitely is supply chain. Even before you actually realize mm -hmm. that was a thing. But um, you being able to talk through it and understand like from a parent perspective, oh, I was going to ask you something else about like being a father, but mm -hmm. I can't even remember. But it's just that either way, you actually making these moves and um, deciding what's right for you and, and having a foundation. I would imagine your parents also had a big, just a big foundation or grounding sense into that. Yeah. yeah so definitely. definitely. Thank you for sharing. Thank mm -hmm. you for sharing and all the different windy roads. And I would say this is a snapshot. So we got to have you back on the podcast. Okay. Right. When you're yeah. like, <laughs> whatever Killing it is. It that, something. Yeah. Whatever yeah. it is that you're doing. Right. And you want to mm -hmm. share like that journey. But I think that what you could offer is a perspective of like following a bit of your gut and mm -hmm. like navigating with the sense that you are the man. Mm -hmm. If there's someone out there who's watching or listening and they're in a space in their career where they don't necessarily feel like they can ask somebody to like fly them out or they don't necessarily feel like they can negotiate for a salary or they don't feel like they have the the um, the guts, you know what I mean? Mm. To be in cer certain rooms without like mm. quivering, like what, whoever it would be, who would you talk to your old 25 year old self or anyone? And what wisdom would you share so that they can take the next step in their career journey? So you would just find somebody who does what you don't do well, well, and ask them how they do it. So like when I used to go to like, in, when I used to go to like interviews um, and you know, they always ask like, um, do you have any questions for us? So I would always, I would end my, my last question would be, because a lot of the, most of the time I'm getting interviewed by, you know, these older people that have been, you know, climbed their way through the corporate ladder or climbed their way, you know, to where they were. And I would say, if you were, I, I, how, did I, how did I frame this question? Because I had it like, I had it like on cue, but I didn't use it in a while. It was like, um, if you were a 21 year old 
looking for this job, mm -hmm. what was what would some advice be that you would tell yourself about this interview? Yeah. And it would put them on the spot to be like, dang, he's asking me for like the answers to the test that I'm giving him. <laughs> I am, yeah. but it's but I'm in a different way. Mm -hmm. So at that point, it's like, well, I would tell you such and such. I would tell myself, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Thank Noted. you. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. Right. So if there's something that if there's something that you're not comfortable doing, if you're not a good speaker, if you're not a good um, people person, if you're not extroverted, if you're not if you're uh, shy when you talk in front of people, find somebody who's not and figure out and ask them how they do it. Mm -hmm. Right. And and re read about it or inquire about it, because the more you the more knowledge you have. And the more information you consume, the better you can be. You know, they say if you knew, if you know better, you do better. Right. Right. So don't there's no there's no limitations to anything that any one of us can do. Like there's no there's no limitations. Yeah. Like me being, um, you know, the fact that I'm extroverted and I'm able to talk to people and I can get in front of a room of people and make people laugh. Yeah. That is a quality of mine. But but if there's plenty of people, there's plenty of things that I don't do well. Mm -hmm. Right. There's plenty of things that I struggle with and I am not the greatest on. But what do I do with those things? I work on them because we're only you're only as good as your least affecting quality. Mm. So if there's things that you need to work on, work on your weaknesses. Yeah. Work on your weaknesses because your 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 strengths work on themselves, right? So me like coming a podcast, doing podcast interviews, I'm good at talking. So like it it's exercising that muscle. Like it's ex I'm already in mode. Mm -hmm. But like if whatever it is that I'm not good at, there's something I need to I need to work on like I'm not good at um, like um, telling people that work for me that they're not doing a good job. I'm terrible at that. Like it's like the hardest thing for me to do is like because I genuinely care about people. Yeah. Right. And so like I have people that work for me um, in the, in this in the youth football space, and they they might not be doing the right thing. Or I just had to fire somebody yesterday from a coaching position. Right. That's a friend of mine. I'm, it's really hard for me to do stuff like that because I, gen I genuinely care about people. Mm -hmm. So for me, I have to like tell myself in my mind, like, I gotta have this phone call. It's like, you just gotta just say it. Like, and I'm in my head, I'm like, you ask me about anything else, I'll talk to you for an hour, hour and 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. But you talk to me about, oh, you need to let this person go or you need to, you need to, have, a, you need to have a talk with this person so, you can, so their performance can be better. In the military it was different because in the military I just cuss you out. It was just military is like it's a different, it's a different animal. Like it's like what are you doing? Like man, get your stuff together. Blah, 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 but not in those words, in bad words. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> it's, but in the in corporate you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So in the in the sector I'm in now I can't do that. The people I got working for me I can't just cuss them out and be you know what I'm saying like that. So it's like I really I'm I'm learning how to deal with deficiencies with people that work for me and getting them to a level of um, a level where we where I need them to be so that we can be successful doing what we need to do. Gotcha. So that's a that's a weakness of mine. But if you have a weakness, work on it. Yeah. Don't just say, oh, I'm shy and just keep being shy. Yeah. You almost have to, like, force yourself to not be like you just got to go do something that you can't be shy at. Make yourself uncomfortable. Make yourself uncomfortable. Facts. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you for that. Yeah. There's, I can't wait for part two. This is gonna be lit. For those of you guys who are watching and for those of you guys who are listening, um, one, thank y'all so much for watching. And Brandon, if there's someone out there who is um, wanting to stay connected and watch your journey and continue to support you, how can they connect with you and how can they follow you? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at the Madison Square Gardener, just how it's spelled, just how it sound. Um, I'm a big Knicks fan, that's why it's called that. But um, um, and then on Facebook, just Brandon Abrahams, and you can catch me on, um, the Living Blessed podcast, um, with Javon, and now, bow, 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 the Work 
and play the work podcast. and play podcast with Ariel. Yeah, absolutely. So. I hope you guys enjoy this this uh, story. So many twists and turns, and I can't wait for the live that we do because then we get a chance to look back at this episode, mm. digest it, have a conversation about it. It's gonna be lit. Yeah. Yeah. So thank y'all again for lit for listening. Thank you again for being on the podcast. No problem. Until next week. Peace out. Peace. Are you? Yeah, absolutely. So. I hope you guys enjoy this this uh